Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Stu Bailey and I'm the co-founder and chief enterprise AI architect at ModelOp. So thank you for joining me uh, this morning for um, the opportunity, and I'm really excited about this opportunity to share with you the experience that our most mature customers have been on with us in the last um, few years. Uh, to get to end-to-end -end governance and scale of AI and model-driven initiatives. Um, this is, a, I think, a really important conference because, um, as we just heard, bringing together the practitioners, your peers, um, in our experience, is going to be the, you know, connecting with your peers and where they are is going to accelerate your journey in getting value out of AI and really all model-driven initiatives uh, in your organizations. So we have some fun ways to share the journeys that our customers have been on. Um, this is not a commercial <laughs> for us or our product. Um, we will use that as an example uh, for the types of um, systems required to get end-to-end -end governance and scale of AI and model-driven initiatives. It's no coincidence that our most mature customers are in financial services. It's been our experience in the marketplace and I co-founded Model Op in 2016. So we've been doing this for a long time. The financial services industry is the most mature in its investment uh, in data science activities, data science platforms to drive toward AI initiatives in critical decisioning in the business units. The, you know, pricing of municipal bonds, the um, uh, detection of fraud in the organization, the processing of emails for customer support, the decision of credit line increases, um, all of the fundamental decisions, uh, financial services in terms of all of the different um, vertical categories is the most mature in those investments, followed very closely by insurance. And now we see those investments maturing in other market verticals as well. Um, but if you're in financial services, you're in the industry that is in the most mature place. So, but that creates certain dynamics. So we'd like to share with you um, in a fun, I hope comical way, some of the dynamics that might resonate with your organization. Yeah, you, you too. All right, take care, bye-bye. Well, hi everybody. Let's let's uh, jump right in, okay? Yeah. Uh, so here's the thing: the board wants to know what we are getting for our AI investments. I mean, you know, the ROI, and also show how we're managing the risks. Uh, it's a corporate level issue, uh, which is why I asked all of you to join uh, join today. Uh, Ira, uh, you're the CIO. Uh, why don't you just uh, kick us off? Uh, me? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, you're right. Lots of risks with AI. Huge exposure. Awana, you know, you run compliance. Maybe you should. Awana? I don't see you. Are you there, dear? Yeah, <laughs> you just, I don't. Yeah, I... I'm here. Um, My camera's just. It's not. Uh... It, anyway, sure. Well, of course, we're concerned about the risks, but Ira runs all the operations. He's closer to where we generate the value and spend the money. So if you're looking for ROI. Okay, look, uh, all of you and the business units have big stakes now in our AI strategy. We're letting software make decisions now. I mean, that's a big deal, right? You know, we need, we need corporate standards. We need practices so we can track and manage all the KPIs, stay compliant. So who uh, is managing this? Managing what? It's called model ops. What is the things making decisions are model. My team, the data scientists, we build the model. Then we give them to the operations team to put into production, keeping the models working within their parameters, managing the risks, keeping the teams coordinated, automating the process. That's model ops. Ah, right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then which of you owns model ops? <laughs> so, so uh, that might resonate with some of you. And actually, the last few years has been quite a journey in terms of um, kind of market organization. There's even some confusion in terms. Uh, luckily, the situation we're in today in Q4 of 2021 is that 
much of that market confusion is starting to um, get reduced. Um, you know, thought lead, you know, <clears throat> industry leading thought leaders like Gartner, who are really tasked with helping to organize how vendors are categorized, some of these terms um, are starting to clear up some of that confusion. Um, and there's a lot out there today. So I think the key takeaway is if model ops is a general capability, and again, it has a close affinity with our company name, but model ops is an industry term. Um, the key takeaways today is that it is necessarily separate and distinct from data science, encompassing functions like risk. Um, what you can think about model ops is that it's really the rest of the organization, the, the corporate level and enterprise level services um, including risk and business, um, being model aware and able to add their context and operate their portion of a model's life cycle with repeatability and efficiency. So the end state of a mature model ops capability, again, sharing with you some of our customers' experiences, they can easily answer with a push of a button these kind of critical questions um, about the AI and model-driven initiatives. Where's the ROI? How many models have we actually built? Um, these are models that are actually making decisions as we've heard before in all sorts of areas in the business units and business line concerns. Um, how, you know, have they gone through the right regulatory processes? So getting a push button overview of where all of the model, um, model driven initiatives are really get drives that end to end governance. Um, and so the question then becomes, how do we get that? How does an organization get that? Um, and the answer really starts with, we have to start with the model life cycle. Why are models the important kind of organizing principle? Because they're the concrete asset. They're the thing that has a security profile. They actually make the decisions. They carry the risk. Um, they have the um, performance requirements from data science. They are pieces of software in some sense that have to be running and have to go through that process as well. So models have the um, necessary, you know, concreteness as an enterprise asset to really drive, be the foundation for governance in general, because they're the things making decisions. So to get to the end state, true visibility and governance, um, an organization has to understand the life cycle. I won't read this slide uh, in painstaking detail, but point out a couple things. The end-to-end -end includes before the data science process and all the way to the retirement of models. So the dark green um, areas of the model life cycle from define on the left to retire on the right, those are enterprise concerns. They're the same for all models, no matter where they were developed and where they come from, and no matter you know, uh, where, what types of models they are. This could be machine learning models. They're, um, you know, this could be rule-based models. There's some very sophisticated rule systems that we've seen now recently in the last, um, cup, you know, last couple of years, natural language processing, legacy models that are part of a more automated AI-driven uh, initiative. So you have to bring the legacy models forth. So all models um, have to go through the dark green processes. The gray process is really data science. That's a business unit concern. Uh, and we see a lot of um, increased fragmentation in that because there are so many excellent tools on the, on the marketplace. Our customers use uh, tremendous tools like Data Robot. I think you're going to hear later today. Uh, from Data Robot, SageMaker, Data IQ, the number of tools in uh, data science is really, really increasing. In fact, Gartner recently <clears throat> announced that they were taking their data science magic quadrant, retiring that, uh, and data science platform, and making market guides for the different types of data science tools. At the enterprise level, it really, we need enterprise patterns um, everything, let's just take a couple, the validation process, um, you know, senior validation review, that has to be done for all models, no matter where they come from and what business use case they're tying to. Being able to tie to all models to a business use case, let's say in the defined stage, 
where a risk team can classify the risk based on the use case, not the model, is critical. Um, the light green is often a, an area of confusion um, because it's really a per model capability, um, sometimes called MLOps. Um, and that's important to be in the overall life cycle, but that's where data science platforms like a data robot and a model ops platform like a model ops center, ours, um, work together to provide the kind of continuous visibility at the data science level and integrate that with the visibility from business context, risk context, and others. So if a model is retrained and then it has to go through an approval process again, that that is ensured that that happens and that's auditable. So that is the way to get that view. If you have something that understands this life cycle, you can then get the information from this life cycle to drive that end-to-end -end governance. Then the question is, how does that, how does one actually get that capability? So then which of you owns Model X? DevOps team can do it, Lou. Really? Oh, sure thing. We already deal with thousands of apps, hundreds of millions of lines of code. Our CICD processes are first rate. I mean, come on. These AI models, they're just software. So we can handle them just uh, like... No, they're not. What's not what? AI models, they're not software. They're not software in the conventional sense. I mean, models aren't written by programmers. They're created by scientists. They're trained by data. We with regular software, it's much more straightforward. Once Lionel's team gets the bugs out, the software runs. But with models, they can make great decisions one day, and the next day they turn rotten like, like bananas. Bananas. So... <laughs> That is a, um, and again, for our customers, almost all of our early customers who are, have a very mature model ops capability today had started with the idea of kind of build it yourself. And I would say um, that's less of an op, you know, we see organizations considering that uh, less in Q4 of 2021, but it's still certainly an, an option. Um, it can an organization build an enterprise capability that really um, allows for not only the definition, but the automation of that end-to-end -end life cycle, um, and then uh, drive that in order to create the full um, visibility and governance. So if your organization is um, thinking about building it themselves, again, this is not an ad for Model Ops Center, this is just our experience of what you would need in general from any vendor, Model Op, or any other vendor or build it yourself. It's really pretty straightforward, which can mean that, you know, there is a, a, almost a delusion that, oh yeah, this is easy, we can build it, but we recommend you at least have these things. One is a production model inventory. And by that, we mean the model is truly an enterprise asset. Model ops is an enterprise capability, not a business unit capability. So anybody who wants to look in the inventory and has a notion of what a model is, the risk team, the business team, the security team, the IT team, the data science team, all of those need to be able to look in the production model inventory and say, yep, that's a model and has the context that's important to us and our function, um, and there's just no question about it. And, and that becomes then an asset that everyone can rally around. to and then the challenge is to keep that model inventory with all that context for the model in its whole life cycle evergreen. Uh, and so what we found is to do that, having built-in process automation that integrates with the different systems, like let's say a model goes through a CICD process. Well, the, the, you need some way to get the information out of the CICD process and put it in the inventory to make it evergreen, to kind of drive the visibility going forward. Maybe it has to go through a risk process, um, et cetera, et cetera. So some sort of process automation that's already pre-integrated with your existing systems is critical. Um, and then finally, um, monitoring. Models, unlike software and any other corporate asset that came before, are making decisions. So what to do if something goes wrong in their life cycle can be very critical per model decision. Let's say the model is deciding which um, 
you know, emails from a customer service position have to be, can be automatically processed or have more human intervention. Well, if something goes wrong in the retraining process, it might not be critical to pull that model right away, but rather start a whole process for understanding what's going on and ensure that an appropriate model is in place in a reasonable amount of time. For something like municipal bond trading, it may be required to get the model out of business right away and ensure that there's a lot of focus on that model. For models that are in heavily regulated areas like credit card, uh, like credit uh, and loan approvals, again, if something is not happening, um, then there's a risk associated with it. Some sort of action has to happen. So it's critical to have actionable uh, monitoring going forward. So those are the kind of key capabilities that any model ops capability um, should give to you. Um, then the question is, who's going to drive that, that type of, uh, where's the most need at first? Uh, and, and who's going to drive such a thing? With models, they can make great decisions one day and the next day they turn rotten like, like bananas. Bananas. Yeah, okay. So you're saying that the data scientists who build the models should be responsible for operating them in production. Oh, uh, us? Oh, no, 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 no. No, we create models. No, we don't operate them. You pay us to build the race cars, not manage the race track. Not happening. Not happening. Look. Well, if it's not the data scientist, then who? Zip is right, Lou. You know, these AI models, very different kind of beast. And they're really valuable. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Worth millions. So then, Ira, maybe this is your baby? Yes. I mean, you run our global infrastructure, right? Well, yeah, sure. But, you know, the business units, they're really the ones driving the AI stuff. You know that. Awana, did you uh, want to uh, weigh in here? No, no, I mean, yes. I mean, there's a lot of risk with these AI models. We've got government regulations, internal compliance, fairness, transparency. We have financial risks, regulatory risks, reputational risks. Okay, fine then. You're responsible for corporate risk, so I'm assuming you're on top of this. So far, yeah. But these AI models are more complex than the stuff we've been used to dealing with. And there's more and more of them coming at us faster and faster. They're multiplying like rabbits. Rabbits and bananas. <laughs> so, so again, that might be a, um, a conversation that you're at least somewhat familiar with in your organization. Um, certainly risk when the, the, of the question of where to start, where's the most pain that would drive a, uh, an investment in a model ops journey, um, certainly risk is one of those. Um, in our experience, uh, you know, risk teams um, really do have this challenge where the AI initiatives are putting more pressure on them in terms of uh, the complexity of the model and the number of models, as well as both external and internal you know, compliance and regulatory pressure. The challenge is risk teams historically have not bought software um, at scale anyways, enterprise level platform software. That's not something that risk teams tend to do. Um, most of the risk processes that are at the enterprise level kind of coming out of the 2008 timeframe uh, really are built to scale with people. Um, and so there's sometimes some um, you know, real requirement for partnership between central IT um, and often first line data scientists, as we saw humorously on that bit on that uh, <clears throat> on the video, to really help risk understand, you know, how to scale these things and be comfortable that there's a platform there. So it, it's really a team effort. Um, it's a classic way for an organization to get started on a model ops journey. Um, there's a few others. Again, we're always happy to have you talk to our um, most mature customers and, and how they got to the place they have in terms of a mature model ops capability. Um, and they, there are in any of those dark green boxes in the model life cycle, there are a number of pain points that can really be focused on. Um, in one of our uh, you know, earliest customers, they were doing municipal bond pricing. The team built great models. It was clear it was going to add value. Those models got to IT. IT said, 
you know, hang on. These have libraries we've never seen. These have to operate environments that we're not comfortable with. They're going to they're going to provide restful endpoints to a trader's work desk, but they have to be changed all the time. So the change management's much different. Um, and it's that kind of productionalization challenge that really drove the initial investment in a model ops capability. And then over time, it expanded to the rest of the value chain um, that you see in those dark green areas at the enterprise level. Um, other of our organizations came in on the risk side. Um, this is a very large you know, Fortune 100 institution um, that had invested heavily in AI for um, fraud uh, and you know, fraud detection. Um, but that created visibility and financial and brand risk if it got wrong. Uh, and the amount of investment on the data science side in the front uh, really <clears throat> um, anticipated a, <clears throat> a tremendous increase in models to be pr productionalized. So um, the need to reduce operationalization time and provide enterprise level patterns that were extremely stable over time and enterprise visibility that allowed them to ensure that there was no, um, that, you know, fraud would drive value without increasing the risk using AI for fraud uh, was just the critical value uh, driver going forward. So there's a couple of different ways to kind of get started on the journey. Um, and then that really then, you know, blossoms to the full model ops capability. Okay, anyway. How many models are we talking about? I mean, at least we know that, right? Like we have eyes on every AI model running in the business. What? We do, right? Wait, oh, I'm sorry. Hey, I can hear you. Hello? I, I lost Hello? you. There. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm oh, you must have muted. Oh. I sure hope that doing model ops well isn't as hard as making video conferences work. How about this? Maybe we need to think about this differently. These AI models, they're critical corporate assets. They have huge value, they're operationally complex, and they carry big risks for the corporation. So it seems to me like we need to establish model ops as a corporate function, connecting all of the stakeholders in the business units, the operational teams, and the compliance team. Yes, we all agree, and now, can we talk about budget? <laughs> And that's really um, the place where the journey truly begins. When one of the organizations, um, and in our experience, um, it really is central IT, whatever that means for your organization, um, has gotten the message from the rest of the organization, generally top down, that's been our experience, um, that some budget is required to start on a model ops journey. In our experience, nobody, um, unless there was a, uh, a, a budget already to build their own, large organizations, um, especially in financial services, have not bought or budgeted a, for a model ops capability at the enterprise level. That's new. So most of you who have been in large organizations for a while know that starting a new capability at the enterprise level is non-trivial organizationally, even if the budget numbers are very, very small. Um, so <clears throat> that has been our experience. Um, there's a lot of ways to kind of de-risk that journey, but obviously to start an enterprise or corporate capability, um, there has to be real benefit. And so, as we mentioned before, in the journeys of our customers um, to date, and where we see the market going in terms of demand for you know, our product, or and in general, the model ops um, capabilities that are in demand today, these are some of the areas that drive that initial investment. What we've seen in practice is a lot of discretionary budgets used to start a model ops journey, and then that grows into an enterprise practice um, that generally lives in central technology in terms of a practice, um, but certainly interfaces with risk, business, IT, obviously all of the data science platforms, critical to be able to interface directly with those 
and at the business unit level, give those data scientists who are focused on specific models the visibility and sometimes the comfort that those models are going to be operated, you know, appropriately at scale, fully governed, so that data scientists can continue to focus on building new and innovative models that are really going to drive the top line. The differential in um, budget is sometimes is generally speaking about 10 to 1 or even a higher ratio of investment dollars into the business units for data science activities supporting AI initiatives. That would be your 10 or 15 to 1 on a model ops capability at the enterprise level that ensures that the all constituents at the enterprise and the enterprise itself is model aware because those are the critical assets and have the uh, ability to automate the life cycle of models outside of the data science process at scale because the complexity of the different models, uh, as I mentioned before, is only going to increase. Different models need different journeys. Um, so these are some of the key areas where organizations can look to justify budget to start getting involved in a model ops program. And a mature, a mature model ops capability, by evidence, will drive more investment in data science because there'll be much more visibility at the board and corporate level to really understand what the return is there as well as ensure that those activities are operated and de-risked from an operational perspective. And that's technical operations, um, classic risk operations, all of the things that make um, AI initiatives risky become de-risked with a corporate level enterprise model ops pro program. So hopefully <clears throat> that kind of gives you a sense of how to get started on a model ops program. Hopefully. Uh, it gave you a chuckle here and there. Um, you can find out a lot more about model ops in general, um, not just our solution model ops center, but model ops in general at <clears throat> our website, modelop.com and talking to us. Like I said, we're always happy. We've been serving the very large enterprise for a number of years. So we're always happy to have you talk to our customers and see what journeys they're on. But it's so exciting in Q4 of 2021. We are really at the, the very beginning of a, a massive increase in data science investments and AI uh, initiatives at the business unit level. We can see it. We can feel it. Um, there's no question that these initiatives are driving real value. The challenge is how to get visibility on that, clarity on that, and provide enterprise patterns that allows for those visibilities to, can, to um, get maximum value uh, and with minimal operational, financial, uh, and other type and regulatory risk. So thanks for your time today. I hope it was enjoyable and you learned something. And I hope we hear from you uh, at Model Ops.